Okay, welcome back here. We're in Las Vegas where all the action's happening in the big data week. This is IBM's Information On Demand. I'm John Furrier, the founder of SiliconANGLE.com. I'm with Dave Vellante, my co-host, and this is theCUBE, SiliconANGLE's flagship program. We go out to the events and extract the signal from the noise. And our next guest is Rob Thomas, uh, Vice President, Business Development, Head of Big Data. You're a part running the Big Data Group, leading the acquisitions, leading the go-to-market. You're in charge of the Big Data positioning for IBM. Yep. yep, we're doing, it. look, if you're not at this show, you're small data. <laughs> and, and by definition, we are big data. So we're excited <laughs> to be here, we're doing some fun stuff. We just had one, we had Stacy on from uh, Venismo, one okay. of your acquisitions. So, first of all, tell us, the folks out there, what your group does within IBM, and then we'll go outside of IBM. How is the big data group? Obviously it's hot, big part of IBM's entire focus right now. Yeah, is sure. Big data. So, information management, software business, focused on data infrastructure, basically making sense of all the plumbing in the organization. We are, we are proud plumbers. Most people like to play up the stack, but we, but we love being down in the weeds and, and we're plumbers. And you know, we've been on a, a, I'd say, a long journey in big data. We've been in databases forever. We uh, did, I did the acquisition in Natiza a couple years ago, which kind of our first move into appliances. And we've done tremendous organic development around a Hadoop analytic product, a streaming product. So we've really kind of evolved our portfolio to cover all the components of big data. I think a lot of people say big data equals Hadoop. That is not our view. Our view is there's a lot of components to big data and that's really what we've been trying to build out. And the database market is on fire as well. You guys have all the right trends, you're on the right vector, you have all this technology. So it's not like you guys woke up one day and said, hey, we got to get into big data business. And not even like even years, a couple years ago, for a long historic view, you had a holistic view of you know, complex machines. Uh, we always used to joke that uh, VMware is building the software mainframe. You guys have the mainframe yep. with virtualization and big data. So that evolution is natural for IBM. So tell, tell, take us through when the big data really started to become key within IBM, not necessarily the technology, but like to, to the business leaders within IBM. Was it five years ago, earlier? Was there a point in time you said, hey, you know, this information management thing, which was basically big data. Analytics, the Cognos yeah, acquisition. All yeah. that stuff, how far back does it go, <coughs> time-wise, and uh, to tracing back to where we are now? So let's go back about seven years. At that time, we had a business called Information Management, and it was DB2 and Informix. That was it. That wasn't really information management, that was a database business. Um, that's when we first started to talk about a vision that said, how do we stitch together all the pieces? And so we did the essential acquisition for ETL. We did Cognos for, for BI. We did FileNet for BPM and content management. And so we really started to build out the portfolio there. I'd say then, you know, so that's what became IOD. The people wonder why is this conference called IOD? It was kind of when we made the move from being databases to being everything that surrounds a database. The next inflection point came, I'd put it about two and a half years ago, <coughs> and I give the, the IBM marketing team that came up with the Smarter Planet comment, uh, concept Im immense credit. I mean, that was kind of the start of big data. We started to see examples, we were working with City of Stockholm on traffic working with Vestas on wind turbines. These were things that were changing industries, changing economies, changing countries. That led to Smarter Planet, and now we're in the middle of big data. And, and obviously we've had conversations with Anat Jingran, who's now moved on to startup world, but when we came down to, to your office, uh, yeah. even going back when I started doing podcasting, this is back in 2005, Enterprise Search yep. evolved pretty much, and Deca was picked up by Oracle. Yep. Um, so that whole search business became a part of an element of big data. Yep. How does that playing into all this? Because you need to find the data, right? <laughs> it's like, it's almost a dead moment, but, but now you got data sets. Yep. You have diversity of data, graph databases, time series databases, um, Hadoop, relational. Yep. So take us through why that piece is important and how does that fit into the picture? You know, I, I wrote a blog post about a year ago where I said I thought 2012 would be the year of failures in big data. And, and the reason I said that was, we'd done so much work with early adopters and we were starting to realize how difficult it is to actually get value out of these newer technologies. So we go through all these engagements and eventually started to have the insight that said we need a better way for clients to get started with big data. Enter Vivissimo. So I got to know the team from Vivissimo, three guys that founded it from Carnegie Mellon, tremendously talented team based in Pittsburgh. Right? You yes. did that Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Tremendously talented team, but what they're really doing, their, their secret sauce is not enterprise search, albeit that's how they started in 98. Their, their secret sauce is they can get a client up and running on big data in a couple weeks. I don't think anybody else can do that. 
Most people can't even set up a Hadoop cluster in a but couple not weeks. Just big data, I mean leveraging existing data systems. Right. Not necessarily, I mean I can throw a cluster up on Hadoop and start grabbing data right. and dumping stuff in and maybe playing with it in a sandbox. Their but value is what I call data discovery. So you go to any client, when I go to a bank on Wall Street, an insurance company, healthcare, the number one thing I ask them is, do you even know what data you have? Most people don't. They say, well I've got this system, that system, that system. I say, why don't we start with you understanding your data assets? That's what Vivissimo is. So Wikibon, Dave, Dave's team and SiliconANGLE Wikibon team, size of the market, what was it, 50 billion? When we first, we were the first like, ones yeah, with the Yeah, by 2017. Um, and we're doing a lot of work. Obviously we're going to be at Strata, I'm flying yeah. out tonight, Dave's going to be here tomorrow, I'm going to go set up the cube for our second run. Um, it's a little bit different. Marks. You guys are you guys are animals. It's this is it's this is like the <laughs> college game day of, of dorks. <laughs> <laughs> it's like every week you're going no, no. to the next geek, hot geek. shit. Dorks and nerds is a little bit different. <laughs> yeah, you know. That's, that's right. The East Coast <laughs> word. You know, I take offense with that. We're sorry, geeks. geeks. Yeah, we're geeks. Yeah, we're right. geeks. No, no, you, I, no, no actually, dorks. In, in all sincerity, we're cool. Actually, you guys are doing a tremendous <laughs> job. I, I'm really impressed. I remember John when you and I first met a couple years ago. You were describing this vision. It's amazing. It's taking off. You guys go everywhere that's hot. You know, we're big, we were a big, you know, we were a big data. It was interesting, because what I loved about what you guys were doing is why I'm so uh, enamored with IBM and, and, and proud to be kind of part of it, watching them from the, from the seats, the cheap seats, is that we talked about big data, and when I was starting SiliconANGLE, even before I met Dave, and Dave has a shared vision, is that it's big data based. So our yeah. entire publication business is based on big data, using predictive analytics, and you know the story. So we don't run any banner ads on our website, that's why we use big data for all that. Um, but we're going to Strata, Hadoop world, different markets, so you mentioned failure to big data, but you didn't factor in <coughs> some other dynamics, which is the market is so thirsty for data. Yeah. They want to drink from the fire hose of big data, they want solutions, they want proof of concept, so it's kind of a sandbox market for the past two years. Yep, no right? question. So okay, we'll buy that, but now it's kind of we're talking business value. So talk about what you think's going to happen at Strata upcoming, because the middleware market in the startup circuit is kind of on fire right now. The yep. guys say, hey, let's build on top of HBase, this, this need to automate. Are you yep. going to Strata? Uh, I'll be there at the tail end, I think. You got to go, If I can right? get out of here. You have to go, because you're like a kid in a candy store. <laughs> yeah, I know, store, I know, right? exactly. <laughs> What's going to be the storylines at Strata for the emerging companies? You know, I the think... The guys you're watching to buy, by the way. <laughs> That's right. So, so you know, I, I think about, like I said, I, I thought this year would be the year of failure, because early adopters went fast and it was difficult to get value. What I see in the companies this year that I'm meeting with newer companies is in a way they've gotten over the chasm to some extent where they can deliver business value quickly. So the companies that can help a client get value fast are starting to make a difference. That's not where we were a year ago. So on the M&A side, I mean, now you guys are public companies, so you really can't reveal the secret portfolio targets pretty much as everybody, um, just like EMC and HP. Um, what do you look for in a company when you're looking on the M&A route? Just generically, I mean, you mentioned speed to value, obviously yep. getting people up and running. Are there other characteristics beyond that that you look for in a startup when you say, hey, you know, you actually have some white space to fill fast uh, in the product line. What do you look for? What are the key things, say, good team? Is it all the kind of startup cliches or is it something different with its IBM's perspective? So, you know, honestly, in acquisitions, the team is often more important than the technology. So that's number one, because our, our view is the technology is critical, but you have to have the team that can evolve it to keep it relevant. So that's number one. Two is, we look for businesses that have been around for a while that have real traction. It's less about size of revenue, it's more about number of customers or people actually using your stuff. Because our view is if, if you've shown enough traction where you've got hundreds, 500,000 clients, that's something we know we can scale because there's enough people that have trust in it. Even if it's small revenue because it's a bunch of small transactions, that's, that shows that you really have- Where moment. IBM can scale up with the- yeah. So it's a scale machine. You guys look at IBM and say, IBM Big Blue is a big scale machine. Can we plug this guy in, this company, yep. and will it grow fast? Yeah, that's I'll give you an example. So when we did Natiza, the day we bought Natiza, they had 1% of their revenue outside of North America, 1%. Oh, you must have loved that. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that was, uh, oh, you like, don't yeah. do any business in Africa. Yeah, that, but that, you know, that's, that's what we do best. We're, we're in you know, over 180 countries, so we can yeah. take that model and scale it. And now we're in, you know, we're in Brazil, we're in, we're in Russia, we're in all parts of Europe, we're all over Asia. That, that's the kind of business that we can grab and we can scale. And uh, you know, the companies love it because they, you know, the engineers at Natiza see that their technology is all over the world now. Can you talk about the Natiza acquisition? That's one of the questions that I wanted to ask you, Rob. I mean, they went first of the next gen sort of data warehouse, data yep. appliance companies. Why Natiza? You, you had the pick of the litter. Yep. Right, why'd you go with Natiza? You know, I got to know Jit Saxena, who was the founder of Natiza, 
uh, probably probably over six years ago now. We'd started working on some partnerships, never quite got it worked out, but eventually they adopted the IBM hardware platform. And you know, if you get to know a guy like Jit, he understands clients incredibly well. He's been there and done that before. We got, you know, really started to believe their value proposition around simplicity, around time to value, get up and running in 24 hours. We saw clients doing it. We worked with them on a partnership. We saw these are the kind of guys that follow through on everything they say they're going to do. Just great people to work with. Got to know Jim Baum as he came in and took over as CEO and, you know, it's like everything else. You decide these are the kind of guys I want to work with. And then on top of that, they've got tremendous momentum in the market and a tremendous product. So it's actually a pretty easy decision. Yeah, okay, and then a couple other trends that we've been tracking. There's a big theme this week at Strata around unification, you know, SQL, no SQL, structured and unstructured. What are you seeing there? Do you, do you think it's a little bit ahead of the time? I mean, you saw Hadap made a big announcement, Hortonworks, a bunch of other folks are coming out this week. Cloudera is going to have an announcement, so a lot of action going on there. Yep. I mean, I presume the market's pulling that. What are you seeing there? It's hard to say. You know, I, I almost think of the no SQL movement right now as a, uh, it's kind of like the music business, where bands get really hot for a year, and then you don't hear from that band again. And you, know, you think about it, if we were if we were decided to go do you know a deep partnership or an acquisition in NoSQL a year ago, we'd probably go do something around Cassandra. Facebook's using Cassandra, everything, and that's all the talk, right? That's that's kind of gone this year, right? Now it's on to MongoDB and, and the new thing. T to me, we want to we're going to watch this market we would like to see it settle down a bit. It's hard to chase the next big music act. Um, and you know, we'll have some of our own organic plays there as well. But for right now, we're a bit of a wait and see. Another, another uh, trend we've been tracking is just this whole notion of, I mean, everybody's talking about Hadoop, you know, making it enterprise ready, yeah. more robust. I mean, everybody talks about that. You guys do a good business there, but what about security in Hadoop? Yep. Um, generally and specifically at the, at the database level, is that something where you see you know, serious white space and opportunities for startups. No question, I, and I'm actually a little surprised. There's a couple guys I've seen that are starting to do stuff around that. I think one reason it hasn't taken off yet is there's not enough clients running, I'd say, mission critical in production data sets right now in, in mass and Hadoop, but that's going to change as early well, as next year. You know, it's coming, it's, yeah, uh, it's coming. You know, maybe so, financial services, healthcare. So I think that's a tremendous opportunity. I mean, the Accumula project is sort of, you know, that's yep. what that's all about. And then, you know, I don't know if there's other activity out there that you I'll tell you what about. model I think will take off, and this is one reason I got so interested in the Nismo, not to get too techy, but they ingest the security profile of the systems you already have. So they don't create their own security model, they don't require you to go build one. They basically say, if I'm allowed to access stuff on this system, but not this system, but I can on that one, when you build the index, it automatically, when it gives me the UI, it only gives me the data that's available to that me. That takes meta the security metadata to them. Yeah. yeah, takes the security. And I think, you know, as I look at big enterprises, if you can ingest the security policy, it's already, these guys have already spent millions of dollars to get that in, right? That's a hell of a lot easier they trust it, yeah. You know? <laughs> than trying to go in and say, here's a new way to do it. Whether so, or not it's the best or not, it's, it's theirs. So yeah, obviously right. analytics is hot for you guys, which is you know, not, not surprising with IBM, but I want to ask a little bit different question on that, on that point. Everything comes back down, all of our CUBE conversations around big data, yep. back to the people conversation. You mentioned the team in the startup, the people in the organizations, the people are the barriers yep. to getting the, <laughs> the things done. It's the people, uh, awareness, education, et cetera, et cetera, goes down. The people is the central variable in all things that's happening around big data. Yep. So talk about data scientists first, and that role, um, how real is that from a hype versus reality, and what's that future position or positions look like, um, and then other people related <laughs> things that you've seen in big data as a opportunity and a challenge. Yeah, you know, I think, I think data scientist is a, is a clever term I, I think in a way it's a term for what we've always done is we've always had people in the organization that just study data, look for trends, look for needles in the haystack. So to some extent, I don't think there's a change there. What, what has changed is the tools have changed, so it's a lot easier to be effective in that type of role. Two is the amount of data has changed, which means there's more to look for. So I do think that role will take increasing importance, but I'm not too sure there's something so unique about that role in and of itself. Yeah. It's just a new set of tools, new types of data. It moves up the stack in terms of user, an analyst now could be a data scientist because they don't have to be a total quant jock or yeah, programmer. That's right. Right. It's more like the the tools, to, the ease of the ease of analysis. That's right. Maybe there. You're right. People who know the business problem may not maybe close to a solution, but actually engineer a feature. 
and it ended up to be a PhD. In a way, yeah. In a way, you dumb it down for people like me, right? <laughs> <laughs> even, I, even I could be a data scientist, at least in a bad company. <laughs> okay, so back to Strata. So what do you expect to see there in that ecosystem? Obviously, they had some traction. What do you expect to see at Strata this year? You know, so we've, we've got over 300 partners that we've enabled on our platform in the last year and a half. So tr tremendous progress from an ecosystem perspective, ranging from visualization tools, a little bit on the security side, a little bit on the file management, a little bit on cluster management. Um, I think we'll see more and more of that type of thing. Um, more, I'd say, creative use cases. I think what I would really hope to see is companies that are delivering vertical specific use cases with Hadoop under the covers, or with streaming data under the covers. Um, I've seen some of those examples. Like and <laughs> so I've seen some of those examples and partners we've worked with, but that hasn't taken off yet. Yeah, well, so there's a greenfield opportunity. Yeah. And those, are the, those are the new questions that are answered. That's going to create those kinds of new companies, right? Yeah, that's right. And Mills talked about that the other day, that ver those vertical specific use cases is really yeah. where, you know, you guys have got the very strong verticals. And, yeah. And they're different. I mean, the, the horizontal stuff is maybe not as applicable out of the box. You yeah. know? We need to see that ROI in these vertical cases. The key thing is, you're right, is to get ROI for the business guy in any given company so they understand why, why is everybody talking about this thing. Right. I got to ask this question because being an old IBM, or I'm always interested in IBM's history. I was a co-op student, so not really a true IBM <laughs> back in the day, but, but I, I'm confused by the whole storage group. Okay. Because like we did IBM Ed, which was a fantastic event, and Jeff Jonas on, and you had a little bit of Tivoli there, you had the storage group, you had some other factions, but we're not hearing anything about storage here. So obviously, big data has to store it somewhere. Yep. So how does storage fit into the equation? The storage group, like the drives, the RAID, solid state, all that stuff, where does that fit in? I think we're actually at the edge of, a, I'd say, a major innovation in storage. So I, I think storage will change dramatically in the next decade. I mean, for some re reason that you see some of what you do is, traditionally IBM storage was in the, in the hardware business. It's kind of like it was a database business back in the day. It's That's like, right. oh, you guys got some disks and you're pumping out you know, through OEM deals or whatever, right? That's right. Now it's like, wait a minute, strategic asset. Is That's that right. similar? Yeah, and I think what, what we are starting to do now is, I'd say, bigger cooperation between the software side of IBM and the storage side. So you guys have probably heard some about what we're doing around defensive disposal, intelligent archiving. That is essentially bringing software intelligence on top of storage, doing some of that logic actually in the storage arrays. It's, uh, it, de it delivers so was, an interesting full life cycle. I was, cycle, yeah. moving it to the right I was talking to an exactly. IBM, uh, it when you can. I was yeah. an IBM <laughs> partner and, and we were trying to flesh out this whole small, medium-sized enterprise value proposition. Because with cloud, you know, you're going to start to have stuff in the cloud. And I said, you know, the storage group, which targets that area, and they said big data doesn't mean anything to the storage group because they're a bunch of hardware guys. So talk about this dynamic because we're seeing this here, a software, software defined virtualization, the network layer, we're seeing virtualization and software be a key differentiator in the hardware business. So is that a false statement? Is that just kind of like, or that's just the way it is? Are the storage guys going to stay hardware? Will they become more software and what does that transformation look like for I, I would call it a, a blending of the stack, right? Traditionally, software and storage, to some extent, have been different worlds. But with some of the examples you use, you're going to start to see a tighter linkage. I will tell you, the one thing that I think a lot of people miss about value proposition around big data is the place that you can, the clients that save a lot of money is actually on storage. <laughs> you can move off expensive. So big data is relevant to the storage group. Uh, yeah, no question. I, no, I mean, it's, 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 it, unless it becomes an opportunity, it's going to be an enormous threat. Yeah. I'll give you an example. So we, I talked in our big data session today about some work we're doing with NICE systems. Um, big ISV out of Israel, they do call center software, that type of stuff. They've traditionally run on databases, high-end storage, you know, pretty expensive stuff to deploy. Next generation, they're moving to their application on top of Big Insights, leveraging HBase. That moves you to a commodity storage environment. Let's talk about HBase, because we love HBase. Our product's built on HBase, the one we're using. And as we want to scale, it's great for what we use it for, but when you talk about production systems, bulletproof, real, major leagues, um, you can run HBase and run stuff within IBM. Explain that to folks, what that means, so that the communities don't think it's a mutually exclusive situation. It's not, I mean, look, the, the requirement that we've seen with some ISVs we worked with, one I just mentioned, another one that we'll announce soon, is when they're moving mission critical apps and they want to run it on big data, they can't just do it on, you know, Hadoop and MapReduce. So they need some type of way to really manage the data inside of Hadoop, right? 
So every time the requirement keeps coming up is HBase. And frankly, that creates a number of complications in terms of you know, can you persist data, eventual consistency, all the stuff that you can imagine. That's where we put a lot of our engineering time is actually making that stuff ready for prime time. Ready so you want to eliminate the complexity by putting a hardened top on HBase. Hey, let HBase go crazy. Yeah. Just move it up to the next level. That's right. That's right. Cool. Yeah, we're seeing the same thing with the, uh, the Hadoop community. We're seeing where there's so much opportunity yeah. and there's so much beachhead for the, for the big guys and the new guys, right? So, you know, I'm envisioning for the entrepreneurs out there, Rob is going to be, you know, he's got his checklist, he's checking it twice or around, around the holiday times. So, you know, I'm sure every company's a target at this point. <laughs> um, final question is, what's the, the vision for you 10 years out? Okay, knowing what you know within IBM, you've been on this nice trajectory, and you have a lot of, you know, good trajectory that you've, investments over years, so you're in a good spot, well ahead of the curve. What's the next five years, 10 years look like from a vision standpoint? So, let me give you a prediction first, and I'll give you a vision. So, I joined IBM in 99. At that time, there was all this talk about e-business. You guys probably remember the yeah, e-business. Yeah, the good sign. campaign. Oh. Yeah. And I remember seeing guys on CNBC, okay, are you an e-business, are you not an e-business, when will you be an e-business? Everybody talked about that. You don't hear that today, right? Nobody's asked you if you're an e-business <laughs> lately, I assume. And my, my point is that e-business became the default. And so the term went away. I think that will happen with big data. I would be shocked if we were sitting here talking about big data you, in three years or five years, because it will become so fundamental to, it will basically be synonymous with IT. Think about cloud. We're not, we're not talking about cloud much anymore. Yeah, you know, it's so already started. So it's I think fundamental. Right? So my I'm one not prediction sure cloud is cloud adoption is <laughs> going to be as big as big data, but I think it's an element of cloud. Well, I do too. Well, what's the saying that, that, that uh, cloud, uh, big data gives cloud something to do? That's right. Okay. <laughs> That's right. Rob Thomas, Vice President of Business Development, heads up the big data group, obviously a center stage here at Information on Demand, the legacy, the DNA, the embryo back in the days evolved from databases to information, e-business, now big data. Congratulations on all your success. Uh, this is theCUBE. We'll be right back with a wrap up right after this short break. <laughs>